very good morning everyone today we will study about echinococcus granulosus as we are aware that echinococcus granulosus is a type of cystodes and commonly call it as the dog tapeworm let us discuss in detail so today outline will be we are going to dis uh, discuss about the detailed description about the echinococcus granulosus and its homeopathic management kingdom it is animalia all the Paras uh, parasites comes under the animalia and sub kingdom there is a metazoa so uh, proto uh, parasite divided into two type protozoa and metazoa so all the worms comes under the metazoa phylum it is a platy elements that means it is flat type worm and class is cystodes so cystodes means it is a uh, common commonly called as a type worm and order is cyclopyridae there are two type of order under the cystodes pseudopyridae and cyclopyridae and cyclopyridae the word it is a larva containing the fluid looks like a bladder so that is the word meaning and family tineaceae and genus genus it is echinococcus granulosus and comes under the this genus there are the four type of parasite worms echinococcus granulosus and echinococcus multiocularis and echinococcus ugly and echinococcus oligoarthritis so today we are discussing about detailed description about the echinococcus granulosus so under this heading we are discussing about the echinococcus granulosus introduction habitat morphology life cycle clinical features diagnosis treatment and its prevention okay introduction so it is also called as dog tape worm or hydadic worm it is the one type of genotic disorders so habitat all the worm having the two type of host definitive host and intermediate host so definitive host means it is in the dog where it is present it is uh, present in the dog and other canine lives in the small intestine especially duodenum and jejunum of the dog intermediate host it is a sheep and goat etc and it lives in the liver and other viscera of the intermediate host if you look this slide you may wonder that human is nowhere it is mentioned so where is the human so human comes under the accidental host so what is mean by accidental host accidental host means it's a type of intermediate host where the parasite appear into the unusual host this and all the parasite life cycle dog and sheep or goat and all it is a it comes under the parasitic life cycle but human is nowhere it is appear that means the humans are the unusual host so unusual host we are calling as a accidental host so man come and uh, comes under the accidental host okay morphology as we have that all the worms comes under the three stages ova larva and adult worm this adult worm for our purpose we divide into the three headings head neck and body the head is known as the scolex and body is known as the stroke lab and again the head part having the three okay, rostellum it is a projection part and hook and septers so when it comes to studying about the adult form we we'll discuss in detail okay let us see about the ova so ova the ova having two layer one layer is known as the egg shell another layer is known as the embryo form so this egg shell is thin egg shell and embryo form is it is a layer it is striated layer okay and inside the embryo form this part we are calling as a oncospore or embryo we are calling as a oncospore okay so inside the oncospore there is a presence of three pairs of hooklet that means you can say that is the reason we are calling as a extando embryo so six or three hooklets and between this between this layer there is a presence of the fluid okay so same thing it is a shape is circular shape and size is 30 to 36 approximately egg shell is thin color is bile stain and embryo form is brown thick radically striated and embryo oncospore or hexanto embryo booklets there is presence of three pair okay you may wonder that last class we discussed about the tinea saginata and tinea solium so that ova of the tinea saginata and senior tinea solium also is a similar then how to differentiate between ova of echinococcus granulosus and ova of tinea this is ova of echinococcus granulosus okay so what is the difference between tinea ova and hydradic ova so if you see about tinea also the features of the same features 
but how to differentiate? It's a very simple example, tinea ova seen in the human stool. Where there is in the hydatid ova, it is present into the dark stool. This is the only difference you can make it in the, while studying into the tinea ova and as well as echinococcus granulosus. We'll go about the larva. It's very important. So larva, otherwise known as the hydatid cyst or metacystode. Hydatid is the word meaning, it is a drop of water. Okay. So where this hydatid cyst present in the intermediate host of the liver, spleen, kidney, brain and other viscerals. The growth rate of this hydatid cyst is 1 to 5 cm in year. This hydatid cyst producing antigenic character and it is very toxic and produce anaphylactic reaction. It is a type of hypersensitive reactions. Okay, so how, how the hydatid cyst is producing? So first the ova will infect the intermediate host. So this ova containing oncospore that attach into the duodenum of the intermediate host. So that will come into the circulation that will reach to the visceras like liver, lungs and spleen etc. That leads to formation of the hydatid cyst. So what is hydatid cyst? Hydatid cyst is oncospore, this is oncospore. Oncospore are encysted by the fibrous tissue and changed into the fluid filled bladder like cyst known as the hydatid cyst. Okay. So let me study in detail. So this hydatid cyst made up of three layers. First layer is known as the pericyst. That is the outermost layer. This is the outermost layer is known as the pericyst. And second layer is known as the ectocyst. This is the ectocyst. And third layer it is known as the inside. It is known as the endocyst. Okay. The size of ectocyst is 1 mm. The size of endocyst is 25 micron. Okay. Inside the endocyst, there are some of the things. This is the brood capsules. We will discuss everything in the detail. Okay. Okay. So here, the hydatid cyst are basically divided into the three layers. One is pericyst, ectocyst and endocyst. And pericyst is the outermost layer. It is the host derived. So it will take the, this layer is formed by the host. And ectocyst is the middle layer. It is it is a parasite derived and endocyst also it is an inner germinal layer and it is a this also it is a parasite derived okay so what is pericyst it is consist of fibrous tissue and blood vessels of the host and ectocyst ectocyst it is a tough elastic glycan hyaline rich layer like a white of an boiled egg so that is a ectocyst and endocyst it is a very this will produce in the all the complications so endocyst consists of brood capsules and protocolex and hydatid sand. Three substances: brood capsule, protocolex, and hydatid sand. This is the one. So the endocyst. This is the pericyst, the outermost layer. This is the ectocyst, and this is the endocyst. So endocyst having three structure. One is the big, big one. This one is known as the brood capsule. And inside the brood capsule, there is a so many round round structure. This each one it is known as the protocolex. This is a, each one known as the protocolex. And the bottom of the endocyst having the uh, protocolex will be settled into the bottom. That is known as the hydatid sand. Okay, we'll discuss in detail. Okay, so as we discussed, endocyst having three structure: brood capsule, protocolex, and hydatid sand. Okay, so brood capsule means vesicular structure from endocyst as we see in the picture. Development of the protocolics. From the protocolics develop from the brood capsules. Okay, protocolics having two type of thing. So you know the collex means it's a head. So the development of the head is the from the brood capsule. So this development of the head is having the two type. One is invaginated and exvaginated. Okay, each protocolics develop into the adult worm. Okay, we will see. And hydatid sand, breaking of the brood capsule leads to release of the protocolex and hydatid fluid are deposited into the bottom. This is known as the hydatid sand. So, when the breaking of this brood capsule, inside the brood capsule presence of uh, protocolex and hydatid fluid. So, this two will come out and settle into the bottom of the uh, bottom of the hydatid cyst. So, that hydatid cyst is, that hydatid substance is known as the hydatid sand. Okay. 
So you can see it here in the histology. There is outermost layer, A layer. This is written as a A. It is known as a fibrous tissue. And B, it is known as the ectocyst. And C, it is known as the endocyst. Okay. And this is the one brood capsules. Okay. In one brood capsule, inside there is a so many protocolics. Okay. And D, you can see it as the brood capsule. And inside the brood capsules, there is a presence of protocolics. So, in the protocolics, in the F, you can see the hooklets. Of course, it is not clear, but this is the brood capsule and this is the protocolics. Okay. And this is the inside the brood capsules, there is a presence, there is a head, this is the head. So, head is like a, it is pushing inwards. So, it is known as an invaginated protocolics. You can see it here. There are this one and this one, okay, the head comes outside. That is known as the evaginated protocollex. Okay, this is the invaginated and this is the evaginated. Okay, next is there is a, another one is one word, okay, encephalocyst. So what is encephalocyst? So acephalocyst. So acephalocyst means hydatidocyst without brood capsule and collex lead to sterile cyst. So, the basic pathogenesis developed from the human being is a broad, because of broad capsule and collapse. So, the, this cyst does not have brood capsule and collapse. So, we are calling as a sterile cyst. These lesions will not produce any infections to the intermediate host. Okay. So, what is the characteristic of hydratic cyst? So, there are two characteristics, physical characteristic and chemical characteristic. So, under the physical characteristic, color of the fluid is pale yellow. And pH is 6.7, specific gravity is 1.005 to 1.010 and it is a non-offensive in character. And in chemical, they have four substances, sodium chloride, sodium sulphate, sodium phosphate and succinates. So this is not in the chemical cell. This is the characteristic of the hydratic fluid. Okay, now that's about the hydratic fluid. Now we will talk about the adult form. So adult form, this is the adult form. And this is the end of the adult form, we will discuss in later. So as we discussed into the morphology, adult form divided into the head part, neck part and body. The head part is known as a scolex and body part is known as a strobella. And head part, for, for our understanding, we divide into the three types, rostellum, hook and suckers. Okay, we will go for the head part. So before going to the head part, this is the length of this echinococcus granulosus is the 3 to 6 mm, very small. And width is 0.4 to 0.6 mm. Okay. It is very smaller than the tinea solium. We will study about the head and neck part. Okay. If you take about this parasite, this is the this is the head part and head, this is the projectile part. This is this part is known as the rostellum and this is known as the suckers. Okay. And you can see it here, it is a black mark here and here. There is a two circular row of Hooklets, it is present in the rostellum. So rostellum along with the hooklets and this is the sucker. There are four suckers. Okay. So length as we discussed, head shape is tape-like structure and size is large, more than one mm. Rostellum is present, protrusible and hooks arranged in the two circular rows as I said in the pictures. Suckers, the presence of four suckers. So this is about the head part. And neck part, nothing characteristic, it is 1 to 2 mm. It is same size like a head and it is a short and fragile. Now we will go for the body, strobella. Okay. So this is the echinococcus granulosus, this part, this part is known as the head part and this, this is each one, it is known as the segments, so strobella, each one it is known as the segment. So what is that characteristics? So the body strobella, the total having 2 to 7 segments. So it have 2 to 7 segment totally and the first two segment we are known as the immature segment and third and fourth segment we are known as the mature segment and the last 4 to 7 segment it is known as the gravid segment. You can see this two is the immature and it is the mature and it is the gravid segment. You can compare the size also you can compare gravid segment. The ova produced from this gravid segment. Okay. Test is 40 to 80 test is in each segment and ovary, numerous ovary and genital port, middle of the segment and eggs 
40 to 60 in each segment it is produced and lifespan of this adult worm is 6 to 30 months. Okay, so that's about the morphology. Then we'll go about the life cycle. So life cycle is a very simple life cycle, definitive host and intermediate host. You know what is a definitive host is the dog and other canines and intermediate host sheep and goat. Okay, so inter uh, definitive host having the adult worm as we know the definition of definitive host is presence of adult worm and sexual life cycle is present. So the definitive cycle, definitive host having the adult worm that produce the egg, that egg will affect the intermediate host. So intermediate host, uh, the larva develop from the intermediate host, that larva will affect the definitive host, the life cycle will be continued, very simple. Okay, so we will talk with the detail. Okay, but here the one small thing is human it is known as the dead end host. Okay, why we are calling as a dead end host. Okay, so human as we studied human is the accidental host. So nowhere appearing into the life cycle of this parasite, unusual, human is the unusual host. Okay, what do you mean by dead end host means? The parasite will affect the human. So, from the, the transmission of parasite from one human to the another human is not possible. So, that is the word meaning of dead end host. So, that means in the simple word, dead end host is the type of intermediate host that generally does not allow the transmission of parasite to the other susceptible host. In simple word, it is unable to infect the other host. That is known as the dead end host. Okay. So, infective form of the human is the ova and source of infection is, there are so many but I am mentioning three. Ingestion of the food contaminated with the dog's stool, direct contact or handling with the infected dog, allowing the dog to feed from the same dish and the host is as we have aware, definitive host is the dog and other canines, intermediate host is the sheep and goat and accidental host or dead host both are in the human. And life cycle for our purpose divided into two human life cycle and dog life cycles. So we will study about the human life cycle. Infective form of human, as we are aware, it is a ova. So that will enter to the human GIT. So with the help of HCL, the stomach having HCL, so HCL will distract the eggshell of the ova. So remaining inside the eggshell, there is an embryo pore. So this embryo pore will penetrate the intestinal gut within eight hours of infections. So after through the portal circulation, it reaches to the liver. So liver is known as the first filter. That means the first organ affected is the liver. So some of the parasite will settle here. 60% of the uh, parasite will affect the, the liver is the first uh, affect by the liver. Okay, liver after it reaching to the liver, it reaches to the right heart and reaches to the lung. The lung is the second filter. That means after the liver, the second viscera affected is the lung, then left heart, then through the circulation it reaches to the other viscera. So all the things, the first one it is the liver, second one is the lung and other viscera also will be affecting. What will develop? Here the larva will develop, that means hydratis system will develop. So once it is affected, it is no other infection to other. So transmission of infection from one human to the another human is not possible. That is the reason we are calling as a dead end host. So dog's life cycle is very simple. The larva, within two months, the larva will uh, the larva will go to the dog's intestine and develop into the adult worm. The adult worm will produce the ova and the egg, infect the other animals. So this is the simple dog life cycle. Okay. So now we'll go for the clinical features. Okay. As we are aware, the cast it produces the hydratis, usually asymptomatic. Normally, it is a asymptomatic and common sight we know, and it affects the five to cents. Uh, it grows up to five to ten centimeter and lasts for many years. And it is the the only sign, the only symptom the patient will produce is the palpable abdominal mass, which may be tender. And some of the other symptom. Anaphylactic reaction, it is a type of hypersensitivity. When it comes to the immunology class, I will explain in detail. Anaphylactic reaction leads to synco, fever, pruritis, articaria, and eosinophilia. And some of the other symptoms vague abdominal discomfort, loss of appetite, nausea, indigestion, obstetric jaundice, and insomnia. Okay. So, this hydratis cyst will develop into the biliary tree, and rupture of that hydratis cyst into the biliary tree producing the 
classical symptom or that is biliary colic that and jaundice that is a type of jaundice obstructive jaundice and urticaria this is a classical sign okay the hydrolysis is present into the lung producing the breathlessness chronic cough breathlessness hemoptysis chest pain with urticaria if the hydrolysis is present into the brain leads to chronic headache with disoriented consciousness if the hydrolysis is present into the bone leads to fragile bone and spontaneous fracture this one is the clinical features of the hydrolysis okay now how to diagnosis so this diagnosis under the six heading we can diagnose it. the first one it is a skin test this is known as the cashoni test and zero diagnosis hydrolytic fluid microscopy histological examination imaging that is x ray usg ultrasonography MRI everything, CT scan and last one it is the molecular method. Okay, we will study one by one. The skin test is the more common and immediate test we have to uh, do for this patient. Okay, so what is the skin test? It is otherwise known as the Cashoni test. It is the method to detect the immediate hypersensitivity reactions to the hydrolysis antigens. So how to, how to perform this test? What is the procedure? It is a simple procedure. The intradermal injection of 0.2 ml of antigens fluid into the forearm of the patients and another forearm with the sterile water. Okay, so we will wait for 30 minutes. If the within 30 minutes there is a formation of wheel, that means the redness, and there is the other formation of the wheel and formation of the pseudopodio more than 5 cm, that indicates the skin test is positive, that means the infected the patient is affected by the equinococcus granulosus. So this is the first immediate test we have to uh, do for the uh, patient suffering from echinococcus granulosus. Second one is the zero diagnosis. We have zero diagnosis. I will explain into the immunology class properly. But here I am mentioning about which is needed for here the common things which I am explaining. Okay, what is zero diagnosis? It, zero diagnosis is nothing but study of the serum for evidence of the infection by the detecting either antigens or antibody or its reactions antigen antibody reaction through in vitro study so it's nothing but study of the serum for diagnosing the infections okay so there is a question will come what is serum it is a basic idea i'm giving so blood means it is a special type of fluid connective tissue as we know okay so in the blood the composition of the blood is the blood cells plus plasma okay what is plasma clear straw color liquid protein of the blood so the plasma can containing water proteins and dissolved substance like a clotting factors everything so water plus proteins everything comes under the plasma okay what is serum serum is very simple clear liquid which separated from the clotted blood that means plasma minus clotting factor it is known as the serum that means plasma minus protein part if you remove the protein part not only protein part, it is removing the clotting factors only. Then we know it as the serum. So study of taking this serum and study whether the person is infected or not. That is known as the serology. It is very simple. Okay. And before going to serology, we should know the two words. It is very important. One is sensitivity. Another one is specificity. What is the sensitivity? What is specificity? Here I am mentioning only the basic things. Okay. Sensitivity means ability of the test to give positive result if the patient has the disease that means we should not be no false negative and specificity means ability of the test to give negative result if the patient does not have the disease that means that there should not be no positive uh, no false positive so simple thing to understand sensitivity means we are assessing the true positive and specificity means we are assessing the true negative. Okay, let me give one small example. Take one example, I am mentioning a tuberculosis. Take under tuberculosis, I am mentioning one example is a Montos test. Okay, so here is a positive patient, here it is a negative patient, this is the total. This two row is the total. Okay, if the tuberculosis patient having the tuberculosis, so 1000 patients having the tuberculosis, they have the diagnosed as the tuberculosis. So we are doing re examination. Out of 1,899 people having the positive and 101 shows the negative. And if the no tuberculosis patient, we are doing 10,000 patient we are doing. Okay, under that, 
9901 patients have negative and 99 patients have positive and total this is the one okay from here how to define the sensitivity and specificity it's very simple sensitive sensitivity means true positive rate that means 899 divided by 1000 divided by 1000 so what happened this is the 90 percent so sensitivity of the particular investigation is a 90 percent that means true positive rate is 90 percent so that investigation can produce 90 percent detect the true positive rate and specificity means 9901 divided by 10,000 so 99 percentage that means specificity means 99 percent this investigation help to help to identify true negative cases is a 99 percent so each investigation of zero diagnosis we should use this word sensitivity and specificity in the research methodology we will also type one error type two error but here in here in the zero uh, zero the diagnosis we will te tell us sensitivity and specificity okay so now we will go for echinococcus gangliosus so echinococcus gangliosus by two investigation one is screening test another one is confirmatory test okay so the screening test have three indirect hemoagglutination test dot immunopore filtration assay and indirect immunofluorescent test all see all this investigation have common background detecting of antibody against the antigen that is the basic concept of the screening test okay so indirect hemoagglutination test it is a type of agglutination test where soluble antigen coated that is a echinococcus antigens on the rbc so what will be detect detection of anti echinococcus antibodies that is in the unit is the titer okay this is the investigation commonly used for the practice that is known as the dot immunocode filtration assay so here also deduction of the antibody against the echinococcus antigens so uh, there are two antigens echinococcus b antigen and echinococcus cystic fluid antigens okay so here if you see why it is very commonly used sensitivity is 80 to 90 percent and specificity is 90 to 95 percent so that is the reason we are commonly used to investigation and second one indirect immunofluorescent test that is same thing utilized fluorescent labeled antibody to detect the specific target antigens so we see under the fluorescent microscopy here also you can able to deduction of the anti echinococcus antibodies so that look looked as the apple green color okay so this is about the direct uh, sorry screening and confirmatory test is the only method is the western blot method and this is a hcf that means human hydatidosis fluid immunoblot this is a very important confirmatory test because sensitivity is again 80 to 90 percent and specificity is 95 to 98 percent so this will able to confirm the echinococcus analysis infection so that is the western blot investigation this is the confirmatory test okay that's about the zero diagnosis okay third one it is a hydatid fluid microscopy so hydatid fluid microscopy after the cyst will be surgically removed that cyst will be examined under the microscopy so what there are two types one is aspirated hydatid cyst that and a direct microscopy or do the acid plus stain so we can identify the brood capsules and protocolics from the cyst you can identify through the microscopy or centrifuge the drop of the hydatid cyst fluid is placed between the two slides and slides are rubbed over the fluid that means take the fluid in the drop and rub it into the two slides are rubbing to the rub over so what we can identify this investigation deduction of the hydatid sand as the sand grains so this is the two method you can identify okay so here you can see here this one it is a this is known as the hooklets taken from the liver cyst and here you can identify the protocolics this one is the protocolics you can able to identify okay the fourth one it is known as the histological examinations very important examination after surgical removal of the cyst okay we have to do some histological staining that is the ENHC stain and PAS stain so what we can detect demonstrate the three layer that means a three layer what is the three layer pericyst echocyst and endocyst so as I told you this is the thing this is the A this is the fibrous tissue B is the ectocyst this is the looks like a boiled egg 
but in the histology it shows like this and see it is the endocyst and this is the brood capsules. So this three layer assessment can be done by the histology and this is the protocolics and this is the protocolics you can identify with the PAP stain and with the HCE stain you can identify the protocolics. Each one protocolics we can able to identify. Okay. So that's about the histo histology. Now we are coming to the imaging. So this is also one of the very common investigation used for the current practice. Okay. So number one is the X-ray detect the hepatomegaly or calcified cyst in the lungs. So in the X-ray you can able to identify the the cyst. And in ultrasonography detect the uh, detect the single or multiple cyst lesion in the liver or other organs. Okay. So the, this is the X-ray of the lung. You can see this is the lesions it is a oval shaped well defined rounded homogeneous density mass so that is known as the hydatid cyst we can able to see and here also you can able to see okay this is the very important sign it is known as the water lily sign or camelot sign that means the it is looks like a flower of the lily so it is totally it is like a flower so the present so this is you can see under the x-ray also as well as into the ultrasonography okay and ct scan and mri you can detect the exact location of single or multiple cyst lesion in the liver and other organs okay you can see here this is the ct scan image and here you can see the cyst you can note it here some of the inside also you can see the cystic wall inside also you can see the cystic wall okay based on the ct scan image the who made the one confirmatory six type of hydatid cyst okay cl ce1 to ce5 okay cl is a cystic lesion without visible cystic wall and ce1 is visible cystic wall that is known as a snow flake sign and ce2 is a visible cystic wall with internal separation otherwise known as a honeycomb sign what we have seen it is a, this one Okay, you can see the separation of the cystic wall. So this is the honeycomb sign. And fourth one, it is the endocyst float within the cyst. It is a water lily sign. As we study into the X-ray, same it will be looking into the CT scan or uh, CT scan and MRI. So that is known as a water lily sign. And CU4 is a non-homogeneous mass, and CU5 is a calcified cystic wall. So based on this, you can have, you can write it the marking types. Okay, now we will go for the last investigation, it is a molecular test. So molecular test, what is a molecular test? It is very simple, detect the presence of molecules in the sample. That means reduction of the DNA sample of the anti, of the parasite. So that is known as a molecular test. Okay, there are two tests, one is a PCR and another one is a PCR RFLB. RFLB means restriction, fragment, length, polymorphism. Okay, so here the PCR is single copy of the few or few copies of the DNA from the clinical sample. Here the clinical sample is hydratic fluid. So that from the hydratic fluid, identify the DNA of echinococcus from the sample and correlate with the genomic of the genomic DNA library of the echinococcus. So from this you can identify the geno genomic type. Okay. PCR RFLP. This is to detect the genotype of the echinococcus parasite. There are till now the G1 to G10 is identified. So example is G3 and G5 is infected to the in India. So they identified with the help of PCR RFLP. Okay. So that's about the molecular. That's about the diagnosis. So treatment. So here I am mentioning about what is the common routine treatment used in the current practice. So there are two types of treatment, one is surgical removal of the hydatidosis, another one is the PAR treatment. What is PAR? P means puncture, A means aspiration and I means injection and R means re-aspiration. So these are the two methods currently used in the modern practice treatment. Okay. So how to prevent? So prevent is three, deworming to the pet animals, especially dogs, it's very important. Promote the hygienic environment in the place and public education about dog tape worm. So that is a prevention method. Okay. Now I am coming to the homeopathic understanding. As we aware that okay, the homeopaths needed three diagnoses. Disease diagnosis, person diagnosis and remedy diagnosis. Disease diagnosis is very important. 
we have to know about the disease diagnosis, not to prescribe the remedy, but disease diagnosis to eliminate the common diagnostic symptom to identify the PQRS symptom. Okay. And person diagnosis in the three heading, constitution, diathesis and adaptability. If you know the disease diagnosis and person diagnosis, these combinations you can able to derive the remedy diagnosis. But in common practice, it is some difficulties. So what are the difficulties? I am mentioning some of three or four difficulties. Few homeopathic medicines are partially proved. Like example is, we know Felix mass is used for the type of tapeworm, but unable to define which type of tapeworm. So that is a problem in things. So which we need to do the some of the scientific research which help to identify. Okay, next is lack of exact symptomatology on the sphere of action in the most of the well proved remedies. Same example is some of the, I am going to tell you some of the remedy. All the remedy have, we don't know like same thing. Felix mass, we know it is a good for the tape form. But which type of tape form is unable to do? And our symptomatology is mixed with the another diseases. Like if you take the sulfur, the sulfur is one of the key remedy for the tape form infection. But if you take the sulfur, the action of, the of action of the sulfur is so many organs, not only to the tape form, there are so many other things. So, our homeopathic metra medica having symptomatology is exact symptomatology. All the symptomatology of the disease are mixing in the metra medica that very difficult to define the tapeworm symptom. Okay. So, third one, eliminating the diseased symptom and finding to the PQRS symptom also one of the toughest job in the clinical practice. So, this is a very difficult but if you go for the practice then it will be very easy. The last one, very important one. In repertory, all the tape form medicines are given into the single heading. So if you see about Boric or Murphy, everything, the tape form is given. So uh, all the, even the tape form, there are so many tape form. We have said it into the last class, there are six tape form types are there. But all the tape forms present into the single heading. We don't know, there is a no division about hydrati worms, there is no division about other worms. This team, maximum is given the only tinea worms. Other worms are not mentioned into the repertory. So that also is some of the difficulties. Okay. Here I am mentioning about the few homeopathic medicines. So here Arica, there is a one, this containing the Aricolin. This Aricolin is the one of the uh, alkalines used for the modern practice for elementiasis or uh, elementic remedy. Used for the elementiasis in the dogs, it acts as a tinea fuge. But we have only this symptom. We don't have much symptom about which type of elementiasis which type of dog, which type of tape worm. So what is required? Drug proving, of, drug proving is required. Maybe we can use for the pathological prescription. And cucurbita, this is a pumpkin seeds. So the pumpkin seeds, effective removal of the tape worm and round worm in children. Other symptoms are lacking. Investigation, exact symptomatology is lacking. Again, it is required drug proving. We can use it for pathological prescription. And Presidia Vesca, this is one of the common remedy used, utilized for the tape worm. So tape worm, the only symptom mentioning into the metra medica, uh, it present into the hot weather with strawberry tongue. This is the only guiding symptom which help for diagnosis, uh, prescription of this fragilia. Still more, we require drug proving and it is a pathological prescription. And Kamala, this is an expulsion of the tape worm. This also required pathological prescription. Uh, required drug proving, we can use it for pathological prescription. And Tanascum vulgari, this is a very common remedy used for the Helimentiasis with nervous symptom. It is, if you see this symptom, as per my knowledge, it, should, it is used for the tinea solium parasite. Okay. For confirmation this, we require drug proving and we can use it for the pathological prescription. Okay. Certain constitution remedy also. Calcarea carb, graphitis, milks, naxomica, phosphorus, sulfur, uh, pulsatilla, silicia and sulfur. Everything we can use some of the constitutional remedy. Some of the clear clinical repertory is mentioning about the temperament nature also. Temperament, warm disease, scrofulous children with during tenditions like a, what remedy is a calipas. And warm children having is a sulfur and tuberium. So these are some of the homeopathic remedy which use for the cystodes uh, or some of the tapeworms. So that's the end of the tapeworm. Next class we will go for the nematodes. Thank you.